Hi, I'm Guy Powell, and welcome to the next episode of The Backstory on the Shroud of Turin. If you haven't already done so, please visit GuyPowell.com and sign up for more episodes. I am the author of the upcoming book, The Only Witness, a historical fiction tracing a possible history of the Shroud over the last two millennia. Today, we're speaking with Russ Briault. He is a longtime researcher and speaker on the Shroud, and today we're going to be talking about the Shroud as a proof of purchase for our redemption. So let me tell you a little bit about Russ before we get started. He's been researching and lecturing on the Shroud of Turin for over 30 years, and he has a highly acclaimed presentation known as Shroud Encounter, making use of over 200 images, and it unfolds like a CSI investigation. Russ Briault has presented to hundreds of audiences from New York to Hawaii, and uh, he has appeared on many nationally televised documentation documentaries, such as The Mysteries of the Ancient World on CBS, Uncovering the Face of Jesus on the History Channel, and CNN's Finding Jesus. He's been to three public exhibitions of the Shroud in Italy, and I am very jealous of that. That I'm hoping to get my first coming up here, hopefully the next one here in a couple of years. Otherwise, he's a long-term member of the Shroud Sciences Group, which is an international consortium of scientists and scholars dedicated to further research on the Shroud. And then lastly, he is president and founder of the Shroud of Turin Education Project, with the mission of which, uh, with the mission to advance the knowledge of the Shroud to a new generation. All right, so uh, welcome, Russ. Hey, Guy, it's great to be with you again. Yeah, definitely, and thank you so much. Uh, we're going to talk about a, a very a very fascinating topic, but before we get going, I'd like to uh, mention two Bible verses. I think most of us are familiar with them. One of them, of course, is uh, probably the most familiar Bible verse, which is John 3.16, and I really think it, it's a good setup for what we're about to talk about, and that is... For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Now, the other one I want to read is uh, Isaiah 53, 5. And I will admit, I am so amazed that Isaiah, hundreds of years before Christ was even born, that he made this statement. And this is 53, 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions crushed for our iniquities, upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. Those two verses just crystallize, I think, everything about what we're going to talk about today, and then how the shroud is potentially a proof of purchase for what God did for us in sending his son to, uh, to the world for us. Russ, tell me, uh, tell me where I'm going wrong on that. Oh, you're not going wrong at all. I mean, it's just uh, you can't I mean, you can't go wrong with John 316. I mean, you know, uh, you know, Jesus is is, is God's gift to you to humanity that uh, and 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 as such tying in Isaiah 53 5, you know, he he took the penalty for all of our sin, all of our depravity, all of the evil in the world. He took it all upon himself. And, and 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 took it to the cross and and then left it in the tomb and then he rose again from the dead and invites us to 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 join him in newness of life in his resurrection and it's um no it's 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 beautiful i mean i mean and 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 the shroud you know is a is a is a validation of of both that indeed God has given His Son and indeed He did bear our bear our wounds and bear our sufferings just as Isaiah fifty three five prophesied what seven hundred years be before Jesus was even crucified and then um, so absolutely yeah it really is amazing and um, you know in the shroud uh, it, it, kind of towards what we're going to be talking about the shroud is certainly something that is a is kind of proof of what happened and uh, that Jesus did actually suffer that on the cross for us and then uh, you know gave up his life 
and then was resurrected from the tomb and then also came back. And uh, he was uh, he was he went into the upper room and he met with the apostles. And then on the second time he met with Thomas. Tell us about how that might fit in. Well, you know, I mean, I, I think the whole message of the shroud is is wrapped up in doubting Thomas um, in, in the fact that, I mean, when you follow the story, Thomas was one of the original 12 apostles and he walked with Jesus for three years and, 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 and heard Jesus say on at least three recorded occasions that, that, that he would be, that he would be crucified and he would on third day would rise again from the dead. And so, and so the, the Sunday that Jesus rose from the dead that evening, he appeared in the upper room. Well, Thomas wasn't there. We don't know where Thomas was, but I mean, and, and it, you know, and Jesus didn't, I mean, he, he didn't, he didn't knock on the door. He didn't climb in the window. He just appeared. And then, and then all of a sudden, and the first thing the apostles wanted to do was to touch him, make sure that he was fully physical and wasn't a ghost or an apparition. And then the second thing he did, he broke bread. And, and then the third thing he did, I'm sure, was he talked about the kingdom. And so, and so, and then he disappears the same way he came. He just vanishes. And then, um, and then Thomas comes back, maybe that evening, maybe the following day. We're really not sure. And then can you imagine how the chemistry of that room had completely transformed? I mean, before Jesus showed up they were they were depressed they were freaked out it says that the that the doors were locked and the windows were shut for fear and then all of a sudden jesus shows up and and then and then everyone sees him so you can imagine when thomas walks back into that room everyone runs up and says thomas it's true he is alive he was here we touched him we broke bread he talked about the kingdom <laughs> where were you and then and then thomas <laughs> holds his arms and says, no, 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 I can't believe I won't. Not until I thrust my hand into his, swat, in, into his side and place my fingers into his nail. And those were his words. A week later, Jesus appears again in the upper room. This time, Thomas is there. And the first person Jesus speaks to is Thomas. He says, Thomas, come here. He quotes his own words back to him. Thomas, thrust your hand into my side, place your fingers into my nail ones and be not faithless, but believe. And at this point, Forever known as Doubting Thomas, now he now makes the strongest profession of faith in the entire New Testament. He says, my Lord and my God. But he couldn't do it, wouldn't do it, refused to do it, unable, was unable to do it until he was face to face with the resurrected Christ for himself. Now, Jesus did go on and say, blessed are those who, 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 who believe and have not seen. Sure, there is a blessing for those who who, who have faith without, the, without the, the, the necessity of proof. But he did not condemn Thomas for his unbelief. And so Thomas then represents the element of, uh, of humanity that's, that's the kind of, you know, arms folded, yeah, show it to me, prove it to me. I, I've looked everywhere and I haven't seen God anywhere. You know, and it's kind of like the Soviet cosmonauts when they went up into space and the, uh, in, their, in, in their first orbits in the late 1960s said, yeah, we're looking around and we don't see God anywhere. And if they had eyes to see, they would have seen God everywhere. And it's um, and so it, so it's amazing. But I think that that the shroud is a gift, just like you said in John 3:16. For God so loved the world that he gave as a gift his only begotten son. Well, you know what else he gave? He gave his linen shroud as a gift for all generations. He gave his linen shroud as a as as a gift to the uh, for the for the 21st century doubting Thomas who is who is who is looking for a little piece of evidence, a little now at the, I always tell audiences this. Look, I, I can't guarantee you that the Shroud of Turin is, in fact, the burial shroud of Jesus. All I know is that it's the most analyzed artifact in the world, and we still haven't figured it out. And, you know, if this was some alleged 14th century artwork, I think we could have figured that out probably 100 years ago with a magnifying glass. And so, and so, it's, so if you're looking for evidence, you're not going to get anything better than the, than, the, than the Shroud of Turin. 
and I, that's why I think it is a gift, and that's why, uh, and that's why I think the message of the shroud is the message of doubting Thomas. It's why he left it, and it's uh, in my I, opinion, right. And I, I, I think that is so important, and you really crystallized it uh, perfectly. And you know, when I think though about uh, those of us that believe without without having seen versus Thomas and then of course the apostles and and I think you're so right when they saw Jesus come back the first time and then he broke bread with them and then he came back the second time and Thomas was able to stick his fingers in the side and stick his fingers in the in the wounds that all of a sudden they're they they must have been euphoric and their fear of locking the doors and not knowing what to do next and you know what what what's going to happen to us? Are we going to even survive? You know the the Jewish hierarchy or the Roman you know uh, the Romans at the time. And all of a sudden, you know Jesus comes back and says, you know, we're free. We're now able to do everything that He wants us to do, which right. is to go out and preach and teach and what have you. That is that is such a good message that uh, that's really perfect. So um, and I think that really uh, plays as well to uh, to today. It, it, uh, don't you think so? Or, Oh, absolutely. I mean, I mean, we're 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 living in a world that is cascading away from faith as fast as possible. And in fact, it's a sign of the times. In fact, when you you know, one of my you know, one of I mean, I've been a kind of a student of biblical prophecy for a long time. And 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 one of the signs is apostasy where people just fall away from the faith. And and it's um and and we're seeing it everywhere. But 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 God does not leave himself without a witness. And and I think the shroud stands as this permanent witness for all generations and especially for this one. And it's um, is, is because, you know, um, I, so I, I, I think the I think the doubting Thomas message is stronger than ever when, as, as it relates uh, to the shroud. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and, you know, and, and I always come back to the question as to do you think God left the shroud to us on purpose? Was that part of his forethought? And I, I know you have a, a good answer to that. So where, where do you kind of see that? You know, it's, it's without question in my view. And that is when you look at John chapter 20, verses one through nine, Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb. She sees the stone is rolled aside from the entrance. She looks in, sees that the body's gone. She runs to find the apostles. And she says to them, and I quote, someone has taken the, the Lord's body out of the tomb, and I don't know where they put him. She thinks that the body's been stolen or taken. Peter and John run back down to the tomb. Now, John makes a point of letting us know that he got there first. And then Peter arrives. He goes right, in the, right into the tomb, and the scripture says, and sees the linen cloth lying there. Then John goes in. He, sees, he also sees the linen cloth lying there and believes. Believes what? Well, believes that he had risen, or at, at least he believed that something extraordinary had occurred. So, so what was it that John saw that convinced him that Jesus had risen from the dead. This is a very important point, is that John becomes the very first person to believe in the resurrection based on the evidence of the linen cloth lying there. It was not based on the evidence of a post-resurrection appearance. No, it was, he believed based on the linen cloth lying there. Now, we have to ask ourselves this question. Was the linen cloth lying there only for the benefit of Peter and John, or was it for the benefit of the whole world throughout all generations? And that's the question. And so, and I can't imagine that 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 God, understanding the heart of God, wanting to reach the whole world, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that that was left in the tomb only for the benefit of Peter and John. There's no way. It had to be for the whole world. Well, and especially, um, uh, you know, when he then later wrote, uh, you know, John is uh, for God so loved the world, the world, to your point, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Really uh, uh, fascinating. So um, now, uh, 
Moving a little bit forward, you mentioned uh, uh, the three witnesses. What's the, the significance of those? Well, you know, in, 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 in Deuteronomy 19.15, it establishes a precedent, a principle, that the, that the truth of a matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Now, it's interesting that everything Jesus did had eyewitnesses all of his miracles healing you know raising lazarus from the dead everything he did had eyewitnesses except for the resurrection the resurrection had no eyewitnesses now there's a reason for that there was a big stone put in front of the entrance so so now i can't imagine that that god would violate his own principle his own word and not have witnesses and so the, the question is not who are the witnesses. The question is what are the witnesses? And so the first witness, and anyone who goes to Jerusalem for a, 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 a trip or a visit is going to go to the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. And the first witness is certainly the empty tomb and stands as a witness to this day. But the second witness, therefore, must be the linen cloth lying there that was the first piece of evidence that caused John to believe, as we just talked about. But the third witness, also mentioned in John's gospel, is the napkin that was about his head, which, 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 is, which is called to today, it's called the Sudarium of, of, of Oviedo. It's in Oviedo, Spain. It's a cloth about the size of a small bath cloth, of a bath towel about 20 by 30. This was a cloth that was used to cover his face, when he after he died, but he's still on the cross. And this, and so no doubt one of the women went up to the centurion and said, May we cover his face? Because you can imagine this was pretty horrible. Jesus' blood coming down his face, stuff coming out of his nose and his mouth. It was an awful sight. Let's it would have been a it would have been a tradition to cover the face of the dead, anyways. And so they so they stepped up there on a little stool covered his face and this cloth remained on his face until they got him to the side of the tomb and then then they laid him onto the onto the linen shroud that then that napkin as it's called you know it's not really a a good term because in english we don't mm. think of a napkin as the size of a bath towel okay but you but you would take this that th th this cloth is then rolled up and placed next to the body and then the cloth is draped over him lengthwise and so this cloth in Oviedo, Spain, has all the patterns, has all the blood patterns, as well as plural fluid, evidence of plural effusion, which is really significant, which is proof that this cloth wraps someone who died by crucifixion, because that's one of the but that's one of the things that happens is that you're through the ordeal of crucifixion and scourging, the lungs fill up with plural fluid, and that's exactly what we see on the sidarium. So those are your three witnesses. You have the empty tomb, the linen cloth that was lying there, and the napkin that was about his head. And guess what? All three exist today. All three testify to this day of the life, suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus. They're your three witnesses, and I think that's really significant because all because because human witnesses would all be dead, but mm. these testify even today. Well, and that's a good point. Is uh, you know, in a court of law, a, a piece of physical evidence is generally more well accepted than a than a hearsay kind of a thing or a, not a hearsay but some you know a witness because witness testimony is not as accurate whereas those three pieces that you're talking about the empty tomb the shroud and then the sudarium the face cloth are uh you know really have evidence that is specifically mirrored in the bible and in the gospels and it represents exactly what uh, what the gospel writers uh, also saw and experienced when they, uh, you know, were alive after uh, after Jesus' resurrection. Yeah, yeah. So now uh, you talk about as well the uh, the fine twisted linen. What uh, what do you mean by that? Well, when you look at the cloth, the the shroud is an expensive fabric. Now, we know that the threads are hand spun. We know that the cloth was handmade, which which puts it, you know, older than the than the than the medieval time period in which they would have had, you know, spinning wheels and things like that. And so it's so but so this cloth 
is a is a three to one herringbone pattern weave with a Z twist, doable in the first century using first century loom technology. Um, they had capabilities to manufacture this in both Syria and Egypt. And but what's the you know what is the significance of this? Why did Joseph of Arimathea? He's the man who owned the tomb in which Jesus would be placed in. He's also the man who purchased the linen cloth. And the scripture makes a point of letting us know that Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man, purchased a fine linen cloth. And so the scripture is specific in letting us know this. And so, so why did what what did Joseph purchase for Jesus? Well, Joseph was a member of the Sanhedrin. It was, it was, it was the chief ruling council in Israel. He was certainly had access to the temple and the temple store. Personally, you know, when you look at the at 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 the at the at the Jewish high priest on the day of on the day of Yom Kippur, which is the one day out of the entire year in which he goes into the Holy of Holies to make the animal sacrifice and pour the 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 blood of the calf and the blood of the bull onto the mercy seat. Oh, uh, what does he do before he can enter the holy of holies? He's got to change his clothes, and he puts and and he puts on clothing made of fine twisted linen, which represents the holiness of God. So when Joseph of Arimathea bought a linen cloth to wrap the crucified body of Jesus. He specifically bought linen made of fine, twisted linen, suitable for a high priest about to enter the Holy of Holies. That's the significance of the manufacture of the cloth. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, one of the other things it says is not, not only fine linen cloth, but fine, clean linen cloth. And back then, clean most likely meant that it was uh, was was uh, ritually clean, which meant that it had to have been pure linen. If you had a mixture of linen and cotton, then it, it would not have been ritually pure, or ritually clean, and then couldn't be used in a, in a burial for a for a Jewish uh, for a Jewish individual. So uh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so now, uh, and that, so that makes uh, so much sense. So then uh, what is the significance of the face on the, on the shroud? Well, when you think about it, you know, I have this, it, it's so many verses, if you were to do a word search on the face, seeing the face of God, it, all the Old Testament, New, hmm. you know, everyone wants to see the face of God. And what's, intri what's intriguing is that is that Moses when he goes up on the mountain he's up there for 40 days and it's at at one point he says now show me your glory and god says he says Moses <laughs> calm down you don't know what you're asking he says you can this is what he says he says you cannot see my face and live so you now he says, you can see my backside. I'll show you my back. You know how the story he puts him, hides him in a cleft of a rock and he passes by whatever the world that looks like. And then, and, but he could not see the face of God, right? And yet, and yet here is the famous blessing of Aaron from Numbers uh, 6, verse 24. Everyone knows this blessing. This is how Aaron, Moses' brother, was commanded to bless the children of Israel. I have it here on a, on, a, on a card. He says, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. But no one ever saw the face of God. And now fast forward to the New Testament. This is 2 Corinthians 4, 6. It says that the knowledge of God's glory is displayed in the face of Christ. Moses couldn't see the face of God. He would be consumed by it. But now with Jesus manifest in the flesh, right? I mean, Gospel of John, first chapter, you know, the, 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 the word of God made flesh, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only of, of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. 
And here it is telling us that the glory of God is revealed in the face of Christ himself because now God is manifest in the flesh and becomes one of us. And so everyone sees the face of God or the face of God in Christ first century. Was it only a first century experience? Or just like just like the whole idea of, of, of Jesus leaving leaving the shroud in the tomb for the benefit of, of all generations, that he also leave us the imprint of his face. And I have something here. You know, this is what I, you know, the 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 this is the photo negative image on the face, right? I mean, was this preserved for all generations? And I think so. But the significance of it here is this. If you do a word search on, on the face, you'll see that, that God sometimes turns his face from you. That's not a good thing. And sometimes he even hides his face. That's really bad. You're about to die. And it's, um, and, and so, so, but when he turns his face towards you, it's a sign of blessing and favor. And how do we see the face on the shroud? He is facing us directly. He's not turning his face. He's not hiding his face. He looks at us straight on because in Christ, we are fully accepted. We are all of our sins are paid for at the cross. We stand before him, you know, clean and cleansed and, 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 and robed in his righteousness and not our own. And so, and so that's the significance of the face. And that's why it's so profound. And I like to say, you know, that the that the scripture gives us his name and the shroud gives us his face. Everyone mm. wants to put a name with a face. And it's <laughs> um, so um, that's what I think. That's, that's that's why I think we have it. Yeah, that that makes uh, so much sense. And uh, and and that means then that God put it here for a reason. He sent well, certainly sent Jesus for a reason. But then he. Uh, you know, he had to show that there was a gift that he was giving and that we he was then rescuing us and that he was then paying a price. And that shroud then is, as you have in your pamphlet here, is the proof of purchase. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, you know, let me let me I, I go around the country and I do these things. Called, I, I call them shroud encounters, you know, you know, and that's my website, shroudencounter.com. And. It's a soup to nuts, 200 images, you know, 90 minutes long, all the, all the science, all the history, you know, we go into the crucifixion, you know, you know, who is this man? Can he be identified? When you do a forensic analysis, right? And then you got crown of thorns, scourging all over the body, wound in the side, and one's in the wrist and the feet. And then by the time you get done with that, well, well who else is it? And then, and then you, and then you finally get down to, to the, to what, what happened in the tomb and what can we derive from the image with regard to the resurrection. And it's, um, and, and, and so then finally we get to the point of what is the message? We talk about doubting Thomas. And then I get to this part, which is right at the very end of shroud encounter it is I believe that the, that the, that the message of the shroud is past, present and future. It's past because it brings us to a historical event. <clears throat> and that's the literal, physical resurrection of Jesus from the tomb. Now, there are millions of people in the world who will say this. Why do I have to believe that Jesus rose again from the dead in some supernatural resurrection? Why can't I simply believe that he was a good man who did good things? And I submit to you, you can believe whatever you want. But if that's all you believe about Jesus, it's not enough. Now, why do I say it's not enough? It's because if Jesus is not risen, he's dead. And a dead Jesus can offer you or me nothing. Only a Jesus who has defeated the power of death, only a Jesus who, who has risen from the dead, only that Jesus has the ability and the, and the right and the authority to offer you or me anything beyond this life. So you have to start with the resurrection as a as a settled historical event. And you don't even need the shroud. You have the testimony of all the apostles who died as martyrs for, 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 that, exact, for, for that exact same testimony. But then you also have the message future. It's in the future. 
and and this is you know there's a verse in first corinthians 15 52 which um i believe may be fulfilled shortly <laughs> that is that that he says paul's writing he says behold i show you a mystery we will not all sleep that means to remain dead but we will all be changed in the twinkling of an eye and then he says or in the, in the niv says in a flash and he says for that which is corruptible must put on incorruptible that which is perishable must put on the imperishable so here paul is talking about an instantaneous transformational event in the future it hasn't even happened yet. It happens at the end of the age. But if you ask the question of what happened to Jesus in the tomb, seeing that there were no eyewitnesses, you have to piece it together. And that's certainly a, a good one to look at. You have the Mount of Transfiguration, where Peter, or James, and John are at the bottom of the hill. Jesus goes up to the top of the hill. And he says, and he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun itself, and his clothing became dazzling light. So here is Jesus before the crucifixion. He's described as a being of light. And then how, and, and he appears to Saul, who becomes Paul, about maybe four or five years after the crucifixion. He's on the road to Damascus to round up some of these renegade believers in Jesus, round them up, bring them to jail, have them executed. And all of a sudden, Jesus shows up in a blinding flash of light, so bright that Paul, Saul is blinded for three days. So put it all together. You know, if, if you were to, were to do a Bible study on what happened to Jesus in the tomb, I think you'd have to assume that there was simply an explosion of light and then gone. Because he obviously, when John, Peter and John got to the tomb, there was no body there but he left his linen cloth there. And so, but you see, the, the, that's exactly, I know this is science fiction, it sounds like sci-fi, but it's all in your scriptures. Just go ahead and read your Bible. It, it's, it's that this is gonna happen to us at some point in the future. Let me tell you folks, these bodies aren't getting into heaven. They're not, they're not made for heaven. You know, this, this this body is old. It needs to be traded in. We're driving Pintos right now. We're, I mean, we're promised Maseratis, and we're going to get them at some point in the future. And I think it's near future. So when you talk about the Shroud as the message past, it's a historical event. It's the message future, because I think the Shroud is a snapshot of what happened to Jesus in the tomb. If it's a snapshot of what happened to him, it's also a uh, it's also a prophetic uh, uh, oracle, if you will, of what's going to happen to us. I'm just saying. I mean, you know, a lot of people say, no, that's not going to happen. Are you kidding me? You can't possibly believe that. Well, all I know is that that's what the scripture teaches, and that's what the shroud seems to represent. <clears throat> now, but the message is also present in the present, in the now we see the price that was paid. That's an important phrase, the price that was paid. You know, there are four words that are commonly used to describe what the shroud is. It's called a relic, it's called an artifact, it's called a mystery, it's called a symbol. And those words are all fine, but they really don't tell you very much. So I got to thinking, there has to be another concept, there has to be another idea. So I searched the scriptures for all the words that describe what Jesus accomplished for us on the cross. And there are four of them. We, as believers, have been bought, purchased, redeemed, ransomed. I'm saying, well, what are these words? These are all words of transaction. A transaction has occurred. A payment has been made on our behalf. So I got to thinking, well, you, you, you know, when you go to a store and you make a and you make a purchase, you're making you're you're making a transaction. And when you when you give the money to the cashier, what does she always give you in in return? A receipt. And what is a receipt? It's a record of the transaction. What's on the receipt? The price you pay. And so when Peter and John ran to the tomb and saw the linen cloth lying there, what did they see? They saw the receipt. 
They saw the proof of purchase. They saw the record of the transaction. <clears throat> and when they, when they opened it up, what did they see? They saw the whole pattern of blood stains and maybe an image. Maybe the image came later. I don't know. But they saw the evidence of the crown of thorns scourging all over the body, wound in the side, then was in the wrists and the feet, abrasions on the knees and on the shoulders. I mean, everything that was paid to purchase our salvation is on the receipt. So not only is it a receipt, it's an itemized receipt documenting everything that was paid to purchase our salvation. That's the significance of the shroud. And what does it mean? It means then, as a believer, that we belong to Christ, we've been purchased, <laughs> and, and, and we have a receipt stamped in blood that says paid in full. And what am I, and you know it's interesting when it paid what's been paid our debt of sin no matter how big or little it may be now that's the amazing thing you know you know because some people may say well I don't consider myself a bad person and I'm saying well good for you because but 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 that doesn't mean you're perfect and 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 that's the problem is that is that you know there's a there's a there's a there's a great um, little uh, booklet put out by a pastor by the name of Andy Stanley. It's a little giveaway book. And, it, and, the, and the title of it is, it's called, How Good is Good Enough? And, and this is really a trick question. I really like it a lot. And he asked this question, do good people go to heaven? Well, you got to think about that one now. Hmm. Mm. Do good people go to heaven? And now nine out of 10 people will say yes. No, they don't. Forgiven people go to heaven because the problem is, is that no one is good enough on their own. It's right in scripture for all have sinned and come short of the glory mm. of God. Therefore, all are, are in need of a savior. Even if you, you know, even Mother Teresa needed a savior. And it's um, and so this is this is a this is a powerful thing. And so um, so to understand when you when you. With the, 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 our debt of sin, no matter how big or little it, ha it is, has been paid for at the cross, and that in Christ and through Christ, heaven is wide open. And it's um, so that's the, 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 the power and the significance of the receipt concept is that you call it a relic. What does that mean? If you're Catholic, there's thousands of relics, <clears throat> right? But, but when you, but when you look, but when you call it a receipt, that brings it back to a theological concept that we have been bought, purchased, redeemed, and ransomed. And you realize that the last word Jesus said on the cross is a Greek word. That word is tetelestai. Now, usually it's translated as it is finished. But that same, but that same Greek word can also be translated as paid in full. Wow. That I did not know. That is very interesting. That is very interesting. You know, one of the things as you were talking and I was thinking, um, the, the gospel writers and then Paul and, and, and all of the New Testament is really proof of what you just, I mean, what you just said then is, 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 is in the gospels, everything about, you know, what's going to happen you know, and I and I kind of agree with you in terms of what Andy, Andy Stanley wrote in terms of, you know, it's not good people that are going to go to heaven. It's forgiven people for those that have faith. And um, and that that message is through the whole Bible. That is what Jesus taught those disciples. And then uh, and that's what those disciples, apostles then taught us as they then went out into the world and and preached about you know the the resurrection and why the resurrection was so significant and then to your point that the resurrection and the shroud then is the receipt for paid in full yeah yeah i close out all my shroud encounters i have this little thing you have in your hand it's a little receipt and it's um everything i just talked about the receipt is right in this little handout and i i hand these out by the thousands and it's um, and it really people's eyes go wide when you when you describe it, because, you know, it, it, it just makes sense because we get we get a receipt for something almost every day as we go to the store, go to the fast food place, whatever we do, we're going to get a receipt for something. And so it just it just relates it back to our everyday experience. Yeah. Yeah. What's amazing to me is that it's 2000 years, roughly since the resurrection 
and uh, the shroud has, uh, as a receipt, has survived, survived various fires, survived various uh, water and maybe floods, who knows, but has survived over the last 2000 years. And um, and uh, I certainly hope that it will survive for all of eternity as long as we're here on this on this earth. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. So, and uh, and it is really a receipt <laughs> worth holding on to. So uh, <laughs> that uh, well, yeah, that... and and you know, if 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 someone and I like to make it to distinguish this because you you started off with John three sixteen for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son as a gift, right? But the shroud is not the gift. Jesus is the gift. The shroud is simply a receipt. Mm. That, it, that validates, in fact, that a gift has been given. And I like to remind my evangelical friends uh, to say that, you know, well, you know, people are going to worship that thing. Well, why would you worship a receipt? You know, no, I mean, you know, so, but, but on the other hand, if someone bought you the most incredible thing you could ever imagine and then handed you the receipt to go along with it, to, you know, it's kind of proof that this now belongs to you. What are you going to do with it? You can throw mm. it away. You probably put it in a safety deposit box, right? <laughs> and every once in a while, you'll look at that receipt to remind yourself of the price that was paid. This is what happens every 10 years or so in Turin, Italy, when they bring the shroud out for a public exhibition. All they're doing is displaying the receipt and reminding the world of the price that was paid to purchase their salvation. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, that makes so much sense. Well, I hope to be there pretty soon when the next uh, exhibition comes out where my wife and I are planning our trip. We just got to pick the date. Good, so, good, uh, good. Yeah. 2025, I'm told. Yeah, I so. know. Exactly. Well, I'm hoping. I'm hoping. <laughs> so, uh uh, well, Russ, that was uh, really fantastic. I thought I would uh, close out our, our talk with a uh, reading of another verse. We started with three, six, John 3.16 and then Isaiah 53.5. The other one that I thought was very appropriate toward everything that you were talking about is uh, 1 Peter 18. And that is, you know that you were ransomed from the feudal conduct inherited from your ancestors not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. Yeah. And how did they, how did they, John and Isaiah and Peter and any of the other gospels write these words if that was not true? Where would they have come up with that if all of that what you just said, and all of that, which is in the Gospels, if that was not true, if the the shroud is the receipt that, that Jesus Christ paid for that awful death that he suffered for us, for our saving and our redemption. No, so, I mean, uh, yeah. You, yeah. You know, I like to say that, when, I'll just say one last thing, and, and that is that the beauty of the shroud is that it's, you know, it is indeed the first gospel. Um, you know, it, it was the first thing that caused John to believe that Jesus had risen from the dead. And they didn't have written gospel for maybe 30 to 40 years later. And it's, um, but, so not only is it the first gospel, but it's a gospel written on linen. And as such, it speaks every language, has no need for mm -hmm. translation. Uh, Anyone who looks at it knows what it is, knows what it means. And, and it also speaks to every level. A five-year-old can look at it and say, look, daddy, look, mommy, it's Jesus. A teenager can look at it and say, wow, this is really cool. And then the academic, the, the intellectual can take it as deep as they want to go into the theology, into the history, into the science. It literally speaks to every level and speaks every language. And there's nothing else that can do that. That is uh, so true. That is so true. Well, Russ, uh, thank you so much. Uh, that's been, uh, it's eye-opening the way that you put the everything together in terms of 
your points about the past, present, and future, and what the shroud means, and what it means, and what it does not mean in terms of the Christian faith that uh, that we have. So uh, you are you can find out more as uh, uh, from uh, Russ at uh, shroudencounter.com. He's put on sounds like thousands of different presentations, and uh, and his message is only encapsulated a tiny little bit of what he, what he does in his uh, in his longer version so i'm i'm sure they're very entertaining and and valuable and really eye opening for all all of uh, all of us christians so shroudencounter.com thank you russ so much thanks guy i appreciate the opportunity Absolutely. And otherwise, uh, for the audience, please stay tuned for many other videos in this series of the backstory on the Shroud of Turin. Please visit GuyPowell.com and sign up for more episodes. And if you like this one, please rate it with five stars. Russ, thank you so much. Thank you. God bless.